Please be seated. Today I want to talk about the book of Numbers. Numbers is the only book in the Bible that I haven't read in its entirety. In my year-long class on the Old Testament, Old Testament seminary, our professor required us to read every single book, but when we were kind of running out of time, he realized we needed to trim the schedule, and so he said, okay, we can go ahead and skip numbers, regrettably. And just a cursory glance at commentaries on numbers will point out that it really has been neglected by the church over the centuries. This is only the second time that Numbers makes an appearance in the women's lectionary that we're using. And the regular lectionary uses a passage from Numbers just four times over the entire three-year cycle. Despite its neglect, I believe Numbers is worth reading because it contains profound lessons for our spiritual journey, particularly for such a time as this. But before we get into the passage, let me give you a little bit of a last season recap. Remember, Egypt had enslaved the nation of Israel for 430 years. Yahweh, God, provided a powerful exit, aka exodus, from Egyptian oppression, and Israel is now free. But the ancient Israelites are also exhausted and scared. They've only begun to live as free people, and they have a lot to learn. Yahweh has been camping with them at Mount Sinai for an entire year, teaching them to relate with God and with one another. And now God plans to lead them on this long journey toward the land promised to their ancestors. But before they leave the mountain, Yahweh orders a head count, a census, to number all the people. And that counting is where the name of the book comes from. But the Hebrew title for the book is more helpful because it actually describes the theme. The phrase, in the wilderness, is the Hebrew name that comes from the very first verse of the book and reveals even more significant than the, census, the censuses, which start and end the book, is this story of the Israelites in the wilderness as they travel from slavery in Egypt closer and closer to the freedom of the promised land. God wants to live with the Israelites in this lush land of promise. And God also wants to live with the Israelites every day in this trudge through the wilderness. God wants them to trust God through those hardships. But the Israelites struggle to rely on God, and this road trip goes south very quickly. So the passage we're reading today marks the beginning of the second half of the book of Numbers in which God's people continually rebel and God punishes Israel with plagues and military defeats and God does offer signs of forgiveness and compassion along the way but at each and every turn the people resume their rebellious ways. And this isn't the first time that the Israelites have complained in the desert wilderness. There's plenty of complaining in the book of Exodus right before this, but they're different. The complaints in that earlier context are treated as legitimate by God. The people need water. The people need food. And so God took the complaints seriously and provided water that gushed from the rock and manna that fell from heaven. In Numbers, however, the complaints are treated as acts of faithlessness by God. In Exodus, the manna from heaven is gratefully received as these divine gifts of food. But in Numbers, the Israelites complained about the monotony of the manna. They complain and they even wish they were back in Egypt longing for foods they freely ate while they were enslaved. This is amounting to actually wanting the reversal of the Exodus. 
So what happened between these two episodes of complaining? What has caused this shift from divine accommodation to divine punishment? Old Testament scholar Dennis Olson explains that the shift between these texts happened because in Exodus, God established the covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai. Before the Ten Commandments were given there, Israel was like a newly adopted child who didn't yet know the household rules. And so God, like a caring parent, went out of the way to meet them in their needs in that immediate aftermath of escape from Egypt. But now they're further along. The people should understand the responsibilities in keeping God's law. And so now they're held accountable for their actions. The daily manna was provided to teach Israel to trust God, to provide what was needed one day at a time. Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. But the people's refusal to be satisfied with the gifts of God led them to stir up this dissatisfaction, which then led Moses to get angry at them and himself, complain to God, and then God in turn getting angry with all of them. But there's an important difference between Moses' complaining and the crowd's complaining. Moses is overwhelmed by the burden of leadership. As the Reverend Will Gaffney, the creator of the lectionary we're using, points out, many scholars have remarked on the significance of the maternal, feminine attributes ascribed to God in this exchange that God has with Moses Moses' complaint asks, did I conceive this whole people? Did I give birth to them myself that you said, carry them in your bosom like a nurse carries a nursing child? It's a rhetorical question, obviously. God, who is more often portrayed in the Bible as king, as a father figure, is here described as Israel's mother. Of course, the people are God's children. She conceived them. She passed them off to this prophet nanny to care for them who cannot feed them because, as Dr. Gaffney puts it, Moses, unlike God, does not have breasts. Fortunately, God does not respond to Moses' request, let me die, literally, but to the substance of what's behind the request, that he's all alone with this burden. In the verses right after this, God instructs Moses, okay, gather up 70 of the elders, and we're going to have this ritual in which God will talk with Moses and take some of the spirit that rests on Moses and distribute it amongst the elders, and in this way, the elders will help bear the burden of leadership. So it seems to me that the book of Numbers, being about these trials of faith while on a journey in the wilderness, makes it a perfect roadmap for our own journey through these wilderness times. We've talked about this theme of wilderness before in the life of St. Margaret's over the past five years or so. And it's a theme that resonates both with ancient Christian tradition and has parallels today. Whether it's the generation-long exile in Babylon that comes later in the Israelite story, Jesus' own temptation by Satan in the wilderness, the setting of the gospel reading from today, the feeding of the 5,000, or think of the desert mothers and fathers who established the monastic tradition. The wilderness is this recurring theme in our tradition. And it's easy to identify modern parallels. I think immediately of the Palestinian people in Gaza and even more of them in the West Bank, living through this wilderness time in which they long for an autonomous nation state of their own. And I think of those days during COVID where we talked about being forced to stay home and navigating a new world as this wilderness time. And the reality of today, to me, has been weighing heavily on me is the fact that we're in this presidential election year. 
And the wilderness time today feels like this acute political polarization. It is the biggest trial of our generation. Yesterday, we took our sons um, out to eat for lunch, Mexican restaurant, and the walls of the restaurant were covered with some very colorful, modern portrait paintings. And there was a triptych on one of the walls of three rather unflattering caricature, caricature portrait paintings of former President Trump. And these paintings immediately caught our son's attention. Now, talking about American politics with our sons is, is an interesting experience. Some of you should know, um, and it will make a little bit more sense. They've only been in the US for two years now, so it's fascinating because what they know is picked up by what they've heard with friends or at school, or specifically what they've been taught by us, their parents. They ask some factual questions to clarify Trump's years in office, and they know that he's running again. And I tried to share impassionately the fact that President Trump promotes his belief that the last election was stolen from him. And to me, even more problematic is that all of his supporters believe it. Our older son remarked, well, that's because they're crazy, Pa. <laughs> Yeah, I want to laugh too, but that's not where I wanted to end the conversation. Because so I remembered, I remember the workshop we offered at St. Margaret's this past January in partnership with the nonpartisan organization called Braver Angels. And in this workshop, we examined why political polarization is a serious moral problem and wrestled with the ways that all of us contribute to it. In the workshop, we talked about the so-called four horsemen of polarization. When we stereotype, when we dismiss, when we ridicule, when we show contempt for the political other. And here I was sitting at lunch with the two people in the world that I arguably have the most influence over, and the four ho horsemen showed up in the blink of an eye. Before I could come up with my perfect thoughtful retort, by the way, <laughs> and instill a lesson about treating all people as God's beloved children, the server brought the queso and chips and the conversation <laughs> abruptly ended. <laughs> so I decided to preach about it for you instead. <laughs> From here, the rebelliousness in the rest of the book of Numbers really only gets worse. It gets really ugly, so much so that punishment involves an entire generation of the Israelites dying, God concluding that this generation is not ready. So by the end of the book of Numbers, readers are left to wonder, will a new generation learn from the past generation's mistakes? And I wonder about us. What life lessons can we learn from numbers? I'm tempted, we may be tempted, to tell ourselves, well, I would never act like these rebellious, complaining Israelites, but the moment our head goes there is, is when the stories have served their purpose, when they've worked their magic, because in reality, the story holds up a mirror to ourselves. The wilderness rebellion stories are like those cartoon caricature portraits. The artist looks at the face, takes individual features of the actual appearance, and then magnifies them all out of proportion. The point of numbers in the end isn't total realism. Rather, it's trying to highlight something about the human heart and the human mind, how fickle and short-sighted we are how easily we can turn our attention away from God. When we forget that we are all God's beloved children, when we know that God has given us the instruction manual to care for one another as God cares for us. These stories challenge us to see ourselves clearly and to learn from the past. They call us to trust in God's provision to share burdens as a community, 
not as individual leaders, and to walk through these faith of our wilderness times. I pray we embrace these lessons as we navigate the challenge of the election year and many things beyond. Amen.